Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone. Just welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We love this time together, opening up the Word of God and studying with you at home and with our 3ABN family here. I can't believe we're at the end of the journey for this quarter. Lesson number 14, all things new. Are you tired of suffering, sickness and sin, wearied by devastation, destruction and death, exhausted by the stress and struggles and strife, God wants to make all things new. I'm gonna to introduce to you now my family here. To my left, Pastor James Rafferty, glad you're here. Good to be here, Jill. I have Monday's lesson, which is entitled, In the Temple of God. Exciting, looking forward to it. To your left, in the middle, Shelley Quinn. Glad you're here, my sister. Oh, me too. I have Tuesdays and it is in the presence of God. Amen. Pastor John Denzi, so glad you're here. It's a blessing to be here. And I have Wednesday, no more tears. Oh, that'll be an incredible mm -hmm. lesson. Last but not least, Ryan Day, so glad you're here, brother. Amen, I'm excited. I have Thursday's lesson entitled, His Name on Their Foreheads. Amen. Yeah. Before we go any further, we wanna to go to the Lord in prayer before we open up the study of the Word. And Pastor James, would you pray for us? Yes, Father in heaven, we just wanna thank you again for this opportunity to study your Word. I wanna thank you for each of those that are listening in, each of our viewers. I wanna pray that your spirit will work on their hearts and our hearts. Yes, as Lord. we get a picture of this beautiful, temple service mm -hmm. and its culmination in the book of Revelation, what that means to us, the end of crying and tears and suffering and pain and evil, Father. Yes. Enlighten us, enlighten our viewers through your Holy Spirit. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 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 I want to start with a question today. If you knew what the future held, would you make the same decisions today? Mm. If you knew your spouse would get cancer and die, would you marry them anyway? If you knew your friend would betray you, would you still trust them with your heart? Mm. If you knew your children would walk away from God, would you still have them? If you knew you would lose your job, would you still give it your all? If you knew you would have an accident, would you still go on that road trip? If you knew your service as a missionary would end in being killed, would you go anyway? Basically, it boils down to this. If you knew what the future held, what decisions would you make today? Mm. This quarter, we've looked at what I call love's commitment. Mm. Jesus knew the future, yet he still chose to come to earth anyway. He knew what the cross held, yet he still turned his steps toward Jerusalem. He knew the physical pain of the cross and the separation from his father, yet he still chose to die anyway. Mm -hmm. I call that commitment. Mm -hmm. He came to die so you and I could go free. He took our death so we could live his life. With his stripes, we are healed. And because he rose from the dead, we studied this for several weeks. We have hope of an eternity with him. Yes. The new heavens, the new earth is not a fantasy. It's not something we just say to somehow placate people. Okay, this is how you get through today's hardship because this is coming. No, Second Peter 3. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That is God's commitment, love's commitment to you and to me, that there is coming all things new. Mm -hmm. Let's look at our memory text, Revelation 21, verse five. Mm. This is from the New King James Version. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. On Sunday's lesson, we look at a new heavens and a new earth. And for that, we're actually going to the book of Isaiah. Most of our verses will be drawn from that a little bit in Revelation, but most of it is in Isaiah chapter 65. We're going to look at nine takeaways of the new heavens and the new earth from these passages. Isaiah 65, we pick this up in verse 17. For behold, I create, we're gonna come back to that word create, a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. 
Isaiah is the first prophet to explicitly reference God's future creation mm. of an everlasting new world without sin and without suffering. And as we study this passage, really, it has kind of a dual application, mm. you could say. It's what God wanted to do for Judah if they were faithful to him, but it's the what God wants to do and what God will do mm. with the earth at the end of time when suffering is gone and mm. sin is gone and the great controversy is complete, we will have a new heavens and a new earth. Let's look at that word create. What does it say? Behold, I create. Mm -hmm. It's the same word bara that's used in Genesis. In the beginning, God created or bara. Bara is used of God's ability to create something from nothing. Mm. And it's always used when God is the subject. God is the one who creates. We can't create. God creates. Takeaway number one, God is a creator and he's also the recreator. God was involved in creation. He's involved in the recreation of our hearts, transforming us, making mm -hmm. us new. And he will be involved in the recreation of the heavens and the new earth. Takeaway number two. God's new creation displaces and ends what we currently know. What does it say? The former shall not be remembered. It's displaced. It's mm -hmm. pushed aside, nor even come to mind. Can you imagine not even coming to mind? Mm. How many times do we think about, oh, I remember this place, or I remember what that looked right. like, or I remember... It will not be remembered or even come to mind because his new creation will be so amazing and incredible that it will completely eclipse anything we've ever seen mm. on this earth mm. now. Let's look at verse 18, Isaiah 65, verse 18. But be glad and rejoice in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. God creates, this is takeaway number three, God creates joy, deep, lasting, abiding joy. He says rejoice in what I create. Mm. Rejoice forever in what I create. Verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem. So first we're supposed to rejoice. Rejoice in what he creates and then who rejoices? He rejoices. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. Takeaway number four, God rejoices in us as his people. Mm. You know, it says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God mm. over one sinner who repents. So imagine what it's like for God and Jesus mm. and the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, three in one. What it's like for them, I can't even imagine having created Adam and Eve in the beginning and loving us and wanting to, us to be restored into the image in which we were created, mm. wanting that fellowship and harmony. Can you imagine the joy in our Father's heart? The joy he finds in us, mm -hmm. in our salvation mm -hmm. and redemption, in our deliverance from sin. The joy because we can spend an eternity with him. Right. Let's keep going. We're still in verse 19, second half. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, mm -hmm. nor the voice of crying. Take Amen. away number five. God takes away our tears and our pain. Weeping and crying are ended. I won't touch too much on that. I think Pastor John is gonna to touch on that more. But Revelation 21 verse four, God wipes away every tear from our eyes. Mm. No more death, oh, no more sorrow, no more crying, mm. no more pain. All those former things are passed away. Let's jump down to verse 25. We're still in Isaiah 65, jump down to verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says mm -hmm. the Lord. Takeaway number six, God creates harmony among the animal kingdom. Because mm -hmm. we think about the restoration in humanity. We right. think about us being recreated in the image of God. Mm -hmm. And we don't often think about what nature will be like, mm -hmm. the animal kingdom and even the plants and how everything will be different in the new heavens and the new earth. Greg and I love nature. And on a recent Sabbath afternoon, we were sitting outside and there was a baby fawn. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
I love that. And the baby <laughs> fawn walked through the yard and then sat down. Mm. Sat front legs first, so it, like this, and then the back legs came down. And then maybe 20 minutes, half an hour, just sat there in the shade. It was amazing. And I thought, what's heaven going to be like? Mm. I could just run over and pet mm. it. What's it going to be like? We're going back, Isaiah 66, go back to verse 22. We were in 25, go back to 22. As the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make sure remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Mm. Takeaway number seven. God will fellowship with us throughout eternity. We and our descendants remain forever, never to be separated from him again. You know, sin brought that separation. Sin brought separation from God. And for thousands of years, we have not seen his face. We have not been in communion. And yet we will be forever with him. Revelation 21, 3 says, a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Mm -hmm. He will dwell with them. That is God's dream to dwell with his people and be with us forever. Verse 23, Isaiah 66, 23, the next verse. It shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Takeaway number eight, we will worship on his Sabbath day throughout eternity. Everyone's going to worship God. Mm. Everyone is going to have an attitude of worship every day, but especially on the Sabbath, the celebration of our creation, the celebration of our redemption, we will have an eternity in the new heavens and the new earth to spend celebrating Sabbath with our Creator. Amen. Revelation 21, 5 is our last scripture and last takeaway. Revelation 21, verse 5. He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. Takeaway number nine, love's commitment will be fulfilled. God's people wander so long on this earth, pilgrims, as it were, in a strange and foreign land. We're going to finally come home mm. because God is faithful to his promises. And one day coming soon, the great controversy will finally be ended. And sin and sinners will be no more. Mm. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy will declare that God is love. Amen. 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 That went so fast. When we talk about the new heaven and the new earth, friends, time just flies because it's mm -hmm. all about the restoration of all things. God right. restoring us to his original creation. There's nothing that you don't want to hear about. There's nothing that you don't want to dwell upon. There's nothing you just don't want to contemplate forever yes. about all that God is going to restore to us. My name is James Rafferty and I have Monday's lesson in the temple of God. The quarterly author of the quarterly says, some people speak of heaven itself as being God's sanctuary. But the book of Revelation refers to a specific sanctuary slash temple within the new Jerusalem where God's throne and the sea of glass are located. And then it quotes Revelation 4, 2 through 6, Revelation 7, 9 to 15, Revelation 15, 5 to 8. And it goes on to say, there are a great multitude of saints from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. All will worship God forever, Revelation chapter 7, 9 through 17. And let's just look at those verses in Revelation chapter 7. I love these verses. They're some of my favorite verses. Revelation 7, beginning with verse 9. John here, it says in verse 9, he's looking and beholds a great multitude. Now, when I've done evangelism from time to time, I always am moving through the book of Revelation. Just before I get to Revelation chapter 7, I tell the people the night before I say, now tomorrow night, I want you to make sure and attend because we're going to find out how many people are going to be saved in heaven. God has a number and he's going to tell us what that number is. The amount of people that are going to be saved in heaven. So be sure and turn up tomorrow night. Of course, you know, the house is full. They brought their, their grandkids and their relatives, and their neighbors and their friends. Because everyone wants to know how many people are going to be saved in heaven. Right. And we open up to Revelation chapter 7. And of course, all the Adventists that are attending know exactly what I'm going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Because they're all about the 144,000. But we start in verse 9. <laughs> After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much room in heaven for those who would be saved yeah. that you can't even number them all. Yeah. 
yeah. the, the, the number of the saved is going to be so great. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for us to count. God is not into 143,998, <laughs> 143,999. Okay, 144,000, that's it. Shut the doors. We're full. There's no more room. No. A great multitude that no man can number. And get this, point number two, takeaway number two, from every nation, <laughs> kindred, tongue, and people. Yes. It's not just from North America, right? It's not just from, mm -hmm. you know, Europe. It's not just from Africa. It's from <laughs> the entire world. Every nation, kindred, mm -hmm. tongue, and people. God is no respecter of persons. That's, That's the right. second thing we see here. And then it goes on to talk about what these people are doing. It says here that they stood before the throne, that before the Lamb, they were clothed with white, ro white robes, and they had palms in their hands, and it says they cried with a loud voice. Mm -hmm. I love this. Just, just pause there for a second because when you cry with a loud voice, you draw attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. Try doing it in a library sometime <laughs> and mm -hmm. see what happens, right? <laughs> and that's the point. The point is God wants to draw attention to what they're about to say. So takeaway number three, there is something very significant that we need to focus on that these people are saying. And here it is. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. They cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God. ascent to the truth and keeping all of the commandments of God, including the health message and paying God. tithe and <laughs> no, salvation God. to our God, God. Mm -hmm. to our God. A salvation mm -hmm. to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. Mm -hmm. You say, God, they got it figured out. Finally, they've got it figured out. <laughs> you see, from the inception of sin all the way down to our time, we're still struggling with this, you know, mostly God, but a little bit of self, you know. Oh, yeah most of the glory to God, but I still want a little bit of the credit. I still want a little bit of the glory. I still want a little bit of the pat on the back. <laughs> Finally, if people figure it out as we get to the very end of time, you know what? There is no way I could have made it. There's yeah. no way I deserve heaven. There's no way that I'm good enough that I merit this eternal salvation. Salvation is to God and to the Lamb. They figured it out. And John sees this picture. It's a beautiful picture. It's an encouraging picture. Yeah. It's a picture that we need to see because he's just seen the second coming of Christ. He's just seen the wicked cry for the rocks and the mountains to follow them and the cry that, that is that goes up from them is who's going to be able to stand and this is an encouragement to John and to us mm -hmm. there are actually going to be people who will be able to stand it's not going to be the eight like in the antediluvian world it's not going to be a limited amount it's going to be there's going to be so many people that we won't even be able to count them all mm -hmm. and then John goes on to talk about a little bit of what these people have gone through. Well, in the vision, he sees a little bit of what they've gone through. And an, an, an elder comes to him in verse 13 and asks him about these people that are arrayed in white robes mm -hmm. with palms in their hands. And that, of course, that white robe rep represents the righteousness of Christ. Yes. And the elder asks him, who are these people and where do they come from? And uh, he says, honestly, uh, thou knowest. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, who they are and where they came from. Maybe you can tell me. And so the angel, the elder answers him and says, these are they which came, verse 14, out of great tribulation, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood mm -hmm. of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. He says, therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night, where? In, in temple. his temple. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to talk about, these last verses talk about the new heaven and the new earth. Now, I just wanted to highlight that because when you compare Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 15 and specifically verse 15 and the previous verses we've looked at in Revelation with Revelation chapter 21 verses 3 and 22 and specifically verse 22, you're going to see that there seems to be there's a possible contradiction here and we're trying to harmonize the description of the great multitude of the redeemed serving God in the temple day and night. I'm just reading right from the quarterly now with the statements that John saw. Well, let's just read the verse here, verse 22, and I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Ah, how do you harmonize this? In Revelation 7, you've got them serving God in the temple day and night. In Revelation 21, you've got them, there's no temple. The Lamb and, and, and God and the Lamb are the temple. There's no temple there. How do you harmonize this? Well, the quarterly gives us a pretty good insight, and I love it. When we compare these descriptions, we find that one description is in heaven before probation and the 1,000 years is over, mm -hmm. right? The, the, it says probation. It's talking about the executive judgment. It's talking about a picture that takes place before the 1,000 years. In other words, this first vision in Revelation 7 is taking place just after the saints are taken to heaven, before the end of the 1,000 years of, you know, investigative judgment, not investigative judgment, executive judgment, looking at the books toward those who the are lost, the wicked. The millennium, the millennium, millennium judgment. There we go, the millennium judgment. <laughs> the, and, and the other 
description is on the new heaven and the new earth. It's when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. In the new earth, the temple has been made a memorial of the plan of salvation, right? It's like a museum piece. It's a, it's a memory of the plan of salvation. You see, it's no longer in the New Jerusalem city because there's no need of it. It is no longer mm -hmm. in the New Jerusalem city because we don't approach God anymore through sacrifice. Amen. We don't approach God anymore through priests. We don't approach God anymore through mediation. We see his face. We see him face to face, but it's not gone. It's sitting on Mount Zion. It's sitting there. As a, as a monument of the plan of salvation and, and we'll be able to access it. It will have the name of the 144,000, which actually is representing the redeemed. It'll have their names in there. That temple will be there, but it's no longer the way we approach God through sacrifice and mediation and incense and priest because we now see God face to face and sin and guilt are forever gone and God and the Lamb are the only ones in the city to be worshiped. Mm -hmm. We don't need to go through a temple service to worship them. We come right into his presence. The temple memorializes the plan of salvation. So the quarterly goes on to say, John could very well be speaking to the services of the temple because John saw no more temple services there, no more mediation there, no more sacrifice there, no more of the services that relate to sin, all of the services that pointed to God and to the Lamb, the sanctuary, all symbolized and represented the plan of salvation, the character of God, the great love of Jesus Christ. The temple was all about Jesus and God. So when John sees no more temple, he sees Jesus in God. It mm. makes sense because in reality, the temple pointed to God. It pointed to Jesus. It pointed to the salvation work of the Holy Spirit. Thy way, O Lord, is in your the sanctuary. sanctuary. So the book of Revelation gives special attention to the one who is being worshipped, the author of the quarterly goes on to say, to those who are worshipping him. And this heavenly worship is centered in God and in the Lamb. And as always, as it should be, Christ is the focus of mm -hmm. worship. Finally, mm -hmm. fully and completely. So Revelation 21 verse 3 reads, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and, he, and, and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and he shall be their God. What a beautiful picture we have of a, of a reconciled relationship, of a, of a time when we can see him face to face, of a time when we don't need mediation anymore, we don't need sacrifice anymore, of a time when the temple becomes, as it were, a museum piece, still there, still a memorial, but the city itself doesn't need the temple, doesn't need the sacrifice, doesn't need the intercession because we see God face to face. Friends, I'm looking forward to that time and I hope you are too. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor James. God brings us full circle back to that restored relationship with himself. Don't go anywhere. There's much more to come. We're going to take a short break and be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. What an incredible study. All things new. We're going to turn it over to Shelly Quinn and Tuesday. Oh, I have a great lesson. Tuesday is in the presence of God. You know, it's interesting in 1 Timothy 6.16, we've looked at that verse several times that says, right now, it says God alone has immortality at this time. But it says dwelling in unapproachable light mm -hmm. whom no man has seen or can see. What is this unapproachable light? God is so pure, it's penetrating purity mm -hmm. that God is love. Love cannot sin. Love does no harm. And you know what? Love consumes sin. When the mm -hmm. Bible says our God is a consuming fire, if you and I were to stand in front of God with, without the robe of righteousness, it would just be, we'd be here and it'd be... Mm. would be consumed because love consumes sin. Moses, the Bible says in Exodus 33, 11, 
the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. But then it goes on in the, just in the same passage. And the Lord says, no man shall see my face and live. You know, he says, so if you want, because Moses is so bold because he has such an intimate relationship with God. He has to see his glory. And, and the Lord says, well, you can't see my face and live. So next time you come up to the mountain, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, put my palm on there, and then I'll pass by and you can see my back. So what does it mean here? You know, somebody thinks this is a contradiction that it says, Moses, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This is a figure of speech face to face. It's saying that God spoke to Moses in direct communication. The Lord spoke to him plainly without an intermediator, intermediator without visions or dreams. And John 1, 18 says, no man, no one, has seen God at any time. So right now, nobody's seen God. If anybody says they have, they're dreaming. Um, but as you've already said, this doesn't mean that the saints aren't going to get to see him face to face. I mean, I love this. There's several indications in scripture. Well, this comes right out and says it, that we will have the supreme privilege of actually seeing our God in heaven. First John 3, 2 through 3, the same John who said nobody has seen God any time. Now he says, beloved, now we are children of God right now. John 1, 12 says, as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. And then he says, but it has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, I can't wait to see Jesus. And everyone who has this hope, John says, if we've got this hope in him, you will purify yourself just as he is pure. I don't think we can overemphasize the purity of God. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people. Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you're not holy, you're not going to see the Lord. What holiness means is that you're separated from sin. Holiness and sanctification are synonymous. They both mean to be separated from sin. So when the Bible tells us God is holy, he's holy because he is love. Love cannot sin. And so what uh, the link between seeing God is that we need to be holy. We need to be pure. First Peter 1 Peter 1.22 said, since you have purified your souls, how? in obeying the truth through the Spirit, by the Spirit's power, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Mm. What the quarterly says, it says, though in the end our title to heaven has been made certain through the death of Jesus, we will go through a purifying process here and now that will help prepare us for our eternal home and central to the purification process is obedience to the word. See, God wants, he created Adam and Eve perfectly with his moral code of love imprinted in their hearts. They sinned, they marred his image. God's whole point of righteousness by faith is to restore us to purity, to restore us to being righteous, having his righteous character. And listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. Let me, let me preface this by saying, anytime you see in the Bible 
it's a sentence and then it says so or so that or uh, here's a declaration that and another declaration. That, T-H-A-T, is a purpose statement mm -hmm. or so. That's a purpose statement. So listen to this. Romans 8, 3, Christ condemned sin in the flesh. How did he do that? He lived a perfect life according to the obedience to God's ways. And then he took our sin on him, on the crushing weight of our sin on the cross. He condemned sin in the flesh. That, verse 4, starts with the purpose statement. So here's why he did it. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Yes. So remember what we talked about last time, Romans 6, 16 through 18. We're all slaves to something. And Paul says, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves? whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. See, we're either going to let our fallen nature reign in our life and let the devil pull us around, lead us around with a hook in our nose and, and we'll be slaves of sin that leads to the second death mm -hmm. or we're going to obey and be righteous. Righteousness is by faith, but righteousness by faith, the whole purpose is to work out in us a willing heart that we love the Lord and that we obey motivated by love. So he says, God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered and have been set free from sin. You have become slaves of righteousness. Who did Jesus say was going to make it to heaven? Matthew 7, 21. Not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name, and I'll declare to them, depart from me. I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. The Sermon on the Mount was Jesus' inaugural event. It was his inaugural address of the renewal of the covenant, the everlasting covenant, the renewed new covenant is what we call it. And he said in Matthew 5 in verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God will fill you if you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed, he says in verse 8, are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Amen, amen. Amen. I know you have more to share. <laughs> uh, my name is John Dinsey. We're on Wednesday portion. I've been waiting for about 30 minutes to correct the title that I said earlier. I said no more tears, actually no more death and tears. And so <laughs> this is the title of the lesson. Uh, I need to read something in the beginning here because the lesson seems to bring out one more time the concept of uh, that many people believe to be true, but it's not true. The idea of an immortal soul. And the Bible uh, makes it clear, has been repeated several times during these uh, 14 weeks or so, that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So the idea of an immortal soul is not biblical. Mm -hmm. And so the lesson brings out the theory of an immortal soul suffering forever in an ever burning hell contradicts the biblical teaching that in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. If the theory of the eternal burning hell were true, then the second death would not eradicate sin and sinners from the universe, but only confine them in an everlasting hell of sorrow and crying. And more, in this case, the universe would never be fully restored to its original perfection. 
But praise the Lord, the Bible, the Bi that the Bible paints a completely different picture. So uh, we're going to take a look at a few verses to, again, establish the fact that uh, the soul that sinneth, they shall die. Sin and sinners shall be no more. Uh, one of the verses may surprise you that I will bring out is John chapter 3, verse 16. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, is the word, but have everlasting life. Now, this is not a commonly used word. I remember talking to some individual about this, and I, and I mentioned this verse, and I said, what does the word perish mean? He did not know that the word perish means cease to exist. It means to die. So here in John 3, 16, you're seeing a contrast or a comparison being made by those who believe, who receive eternal life, and those who do not believe, they perish. You see, eternal life is given, given to those that believe, not to those that do not believe. We do not have an immortal soul. We are mortal, the Bible, uh, as the Bible says, and as you have heard several times during this quarterly. Again, we bring to you Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. It does not say for the wages of sin is eternally burning in hell. It says the wages of sin is death. And then it continues by saying, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, eternal life is given to those that believe in Jesus and follow Him. Now, I want to bring out the fairness of God. Uh, I point to you Exodus chapter 21, uh, verses 23, 24, and 25. Notice the exactness here that God brings out. If, and if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So you see, God brings an exact measure of punishment for the evil done. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So it's an exact measure given for the guilt. You know, it seems to me that people place uh, man with greater mercy than God. Consider for the, a moment the idea that, let's say somebody killed somebody in this world, they're taken to court, they're found guilty, they put them in prison, sometimes for life, they say for life, or they give you 50 year sentence, whatever it may be. But then after 10 years of quote unquote good behavior, they say you have paid your debt to society, you can go free. So you see, you're giving people that are sinful uh, the idea that they're more merciful than God. God is merciful. God is love, but He is fair in all things. So when He says the wages of sin is death, that's what you should expect. The wages of sin is death. Not anything else than that. Uh, this has been examined in lesson number 11, no, lesson number 10, lesson number 10, and it has been mentioned throughout this quarterly that the immortal, the idea of an immortal soul is not biblical. It, it is not biblical. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28 because this may surprise some of you. Uh, here it's talking about Lucifer and it is uh, the king... The king of Tyre is used as a symbol, and you can tell by the context that it's talking about Lucifer, the angel that sinned and rebelled against God. Notice how it says now in verse 17, when God expresses that he will take action against them, thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. This is talking about Satan. Verse 19 says, All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished. At thee, thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. So if the Bible tells us that Satan himself 
uh, after being thrown into the lake of fire, as it says in Revelation chapter 20, which we don't have time to look at now, but this is uh, very clear that we just read, eventually he will die, turn to ashes, and it says here, never shall he be any more. Now I bring to you God's wonderful mercy. Second, Corinth, uh, second, second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We have the opportunity to repent. Jesus Christ has died, the equivalent of the second death for us. We do not need to die that death because he died that for us on the cross, taking our sins upon him so that we can be free from sin and receive his righteousness, become his children and live eternally. If you believe and follow Jesus, you will have everlasting life. You know, we're in a great controversy between good and evil. And in Romans chapter 8, some things are brought out that are beautiful. Now it says, beginning in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with pang, pangs together until now. So even the whole creation suffers because of sin and God is gonna do away with all sin and suffering. I praise the Lord for that. And that's why John 16, verse 33, we take hope in what Jesus said. These things I have spoken unto you. That's John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ has overcome the world. Jesus Christ has overcome the devil. And the time is coming when God's children will be completely delivered and then will come to pass that which is revealed in Revelation 21, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let us read it quickly. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. All the suffering ends. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And I know that many hearing my voice suffer pain, some on a daily basis. Some suffer pain because of things they see in the world. Daily we hear records of suffering in the world. God is gonna do away with all this pain and suffering. He will wipe away all tears from our eyes and there will be no more death, no sorrow for the former things have passed away. Praise be to God. Mm, praise God. Can't wait to that time. Amen. Can't wait to that time. Amen. My name is Ryan Day. I have Thursday's lesson entitled His Name on Their Foreheads. And the lesson uh, has us diving into Revelation chapter 22. And we're going to read some various um, scriptures from this particular chapter and others. But we're going to start with verse 3 and work our way through and just kind of break this down. Because, you know, we, we have something powerful to look forward to. And God, as we've learned, we, we serve a God of love and He wants each and every one of us. He doesn't want us to perish, but He wants us to have that access to that everlasting life. And uh, I love what, what this verse starts out with. Revelation 22, verse 3, it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it and His servants shall serve Him. I love that. In fact, it's quite interesting because, you know, John, like he does many times in his books, 
uh, he points us back to the beginning. He reminds us how far we've come. And so when it's interesting, when he says there shall be no more, no more curse, just to put this in perspective, you know, first couple of chapters of Genesis, what do we see happening? Creation. And then you're not too far into it. And before you know it, you know, sin has entered into the picture. But, you know, uh, again, perfect, uninterrupted communion between God and man in these first few chapters, just as God intended it to be. And notice this. He takes us all the way back to the beginning right here in the Bible. But look at that big chunk right there. That's all, that's all, you know, uh, it's all conflict and, and great controversy and covenant and all that. But then, you know, he, he's looking all the way back in, in, uh, from chapter 22 here. And he's reminding us that we, we've, been in, we've been cursed. We've been cursed from the very beginning. In fact, let's read that in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 19. Let's remind ourselves of what, what, what God is going to basically, uh, uh, he's going to restore us from this curse. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And here it is. Great controversy. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And you shall bruise your head and excuse me, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. But then to the woman, he says, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth uh, children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The ultimate curse here is death. And that's what, that's what he's looking at here. He says there shall be no more curse because he's now, God is going to restore all things. He's going to break that, break that, uh, that horrible curse and he's going to restore all things back to the way it was in the beginning, just the way he wanted it to be. Uh, it goes on to say, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him. You know, I love that because it reminds me of the fact that God always wants to be with his people. This is what he intended from the beginning. He wants to be with you. He doesn't want to be separate from us. He wants to be in our very presence. I think of Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But praise God, as we learn from Pastor Rafferty, when this time comes, there's going to be no need for a temple anymore because we're going to be face to face with our creator. But we go on to verse 4. It says, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. My friends, this is referencing very much clearly. I mean, obviously the forehead region, the forehead, what does the forehead represent? It represents the mind. It represents character. It represents, in this case, having his name on our, in our foreheads represents the fact that we are going to have God's righteous character in our mind. We are going to finally have the mind of Christ, just as the Bible tells us all about that. We, we know that in being in harmony and a reflection of his character and having his name written on our foreheads as a symbol of the mind and the heart and the character of Jesus, we know that we will be a commandment keeping people. We would just naturally live according to that perfect law because our God is perfect and we will be just like him. But it's interesting though, in these last days, God is still calling us to be like him. That, that hasn't changed. Even before all of this restoration, God is still appealing to our hearts and he's saying, I want you to be like me. I want to make you a new creature in God. And so it, you, in the last days, you have two choices. Either you worship the dragon or you worship the creator. And, and the, those who will have the name of the Lord in their foreheads will be those who have rejected the mark or the name or the character of the dragon, of Satan himself. I think of Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I, then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our 
our God in their foreheads. So this is this, this is the, the name, the character of God, the seal of God in our name, you know, on our foreheads and in our minds. Revelation chapter 15, verse two, just on that same note, I had to tie this in because it says, and I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over the image and over notice his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. This is a representation of the, 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 the different the comparison between those who surrender fully to the Lord, they have his name and his character in their heart and in their mind versus those who do not surrender to the Lord and they end up receiving the mark of the beast and they are a reflection of the name and the character of the enemy. I encourage you also to go read Revelation chapter 20 verse 4 and also Revelation chapter 14 verses 9, 10 and 12 because right there in chapter, chapter 14 verse 12 it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We know that God's commandment law is a, ref it's, it's a transcript of his character. And if we're going to have God's name on our foreheads and we're going to have his heart, his mind and his love in us, then we have to also be a reflection of that character, which means we are, our lives will be in harmony with the Ten Commandments of God. You know, it says there in, in just in the same chapter, this is Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. It says, blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. You know, I bring this text up because at the beginning of this lesson, it asks the question, it says, how can we be assured that we'll be among those who will have the name of God written on their foreheads? Or can we be assured? Absolutely. In fact, right there, as we just read verse 14, we know that in, in order to make sure that we are a part of God's, uh, God's kingdom and, and, and we're going to have his name written on our foreheads, we need to make sure that we bring our lives into subjection to his law and his will. Not that, again, the commandments save us. We know the commandments in and of themselves cannot save us, but only what Christ is done, but because we are saved and because we do love him and we want to fall in obedience to him and his will, we will be a commandment keeping people. But it's also quite eye opening to notice that when you read that text there in Revelation chapter 22, where it says, talks about those who do his commandments may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. It says in verse 15, right after that, it says, but outside. Mm. But outside are dogs and, sor and sorcerers and sexual immorals and murders and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. You know, my mind immediately went to what we see in Revelation chapter 21, uh, the description of the city. If you read Revelation, and I'm going to reference these real quick, but it says Revelation 21 uh, verses 10, 11, and 18. It's, it describes the city as being clear as crystal. The walls uh, like, like, tr uh, like jasper, like transparent glass. Now I can imagine when we get down at the end of time, there's going to be someone on the inside of that city that's going to look through those transparent walls and they're going to see when that time comes, someone that they wish would have been in there with them. A family member, a husband, a wife standing out looking at their spouse. All those times that they begged them to come to church. All those times they begged them to surrender to the Lord. Mothers and fathers looking out at their children who refuse to surrender to the Lord. My friends, we're living in, 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 in important times that there's coming a time when all that, that God has created will be together, the righteous and the unrighteous, those on the inside of the city, those on the outside of the city. Those on the inside of the city have the Father's name and character in their foreheads, in their minds, and they reflect His love. Those on the outside, they do not. But make no mistake, those on the outside, they will bow and they will confess that Jesus is Lord. My friends, I want to just appeal to you in closing here that wherever you are in your life, it's never too late that wherever you are, to call out to the Lord and say, God, search me. Show me what it is that's separating me for you, from you, if at all. Give your heart to him while you can because time is of the essence. And as he says, not once, not twice, but three times in the last chapter of the Bible, behold, I come quickly. And he will indeed be here sooner than later. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. What an incredible appeal. I want to give each one of you a moment to share a final thought. Well, final thought on our lesson on in the temple is from John chapter 17, actually it's chapter 16. And it says here, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, verse 25, these things I have spoken unto you, 
in Proverbs or parables, but the time is coming when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Then he goes on to say this, At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. One day we're going to see the Father face to face. No more mediator, no more temple, no more sacrifice. Face to face we're going to see the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know him just as I am also known. God knows everything about you, but the day is coming when you will get to see His glory, stand in His presence, worship Him face to face, mm -hmm. when God can cup His hands on your face and say, Welcome, my son, my daughter, to the New Jerusalem. You know, people use cheese to catch mice. We put baits on fish hooks to catch fish. I don't know what bait the devil has put out so that you could be enticed and be captured by him. But Jesus is offering us freedom. Jesus is offering us eternal life and peace. And I encourage you to accept that free offer of Jesus and your suffering will end. Mm, amen. Revelation 22, 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. Come, let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, Pastor Johnny, Shelley, and Pastor James. It's been an incredible quarter, an incredible study. I want to end with Revelation 15. This is the song of Moses and the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. At the very end, we will see the justice and holiness of God. Join us next quarter as we study the concept of stewardship.